don't worry. The, this passage of scripture is found in Matthew chapter 6. And we read from verse, verse 25. From verse 25. I'm reading from the Holman Christian Standard Bible. It says, this is why I tell you, don't worry about your life what you will eat or what you will drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Isn't life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the sky. They do not sow nor reap or gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. And Jesus continues this sermon from, from verse 25 down to verse 34. And the conclusion is that he says, therefore, don't worry about tomorrow because tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Now, this sermon or this passage of scripture, I find it to be one of the, one of the most organized passages of scripture in the Bible in terms of homiletics. As a, as a preacher, you you most times have to take a passage and get the message from it and then you organize it to present it. But in this passage of scripture, I don't know if Matthew is the one who, who did it that way or Jesus presented the sermon so well organized, but it has all the elements of a good sermon. It has the introduction, it has the body with all the points laid out, and it has the conclusion. You know, it might be an easy sermon to preach for most persons, but for me, it's, it's very difficult because it's so easy. It's so, it's so well laid out. And the message, the thesis statement of the sermon is do not worry or do not worry about your life. You see, in this passage of scripture, the Lord wants to remove the anxiety or the excuse that some people give for focusing on money rather than focusing on the Lord. Let me repeat that. In this passage of scripture, the Lord wants to remove the anxiety or the excuse that some people give for focusing on money rather than focusing on God. Because just before this passage, the verse that comes immediately before is it, before it says, that you cannot serve God and money. That's the passage that immediately precedes Matthew, 20, Matthew 6, 25 to 33. You cannot serve God and money at the same time. And so this entire passage, this entire sermon is making the point that you don't need to serve God and money at the same time. You can focus on God and all will be well with you. So Jesus says, don't worry about the two main concerns that people have, or two of the main concerns that people have, food and clothing. Are you with me? Food and clothing. And I want to philosophize it in the sense that we are worried about what to eat and we are worried about how we look. Those are two of the main concerns that people have in life. And Jesus is saying, don't worry about it. Put me first and I'll take care of it. That's what Jesus wants us to do. And so he says to them, if you want to know, if you want to know, <laughs> if you want to know that God is trustworthy, if you want to know that God can be trusted with these two very important aspects of your life, Jesus says, look at the birds. Look at the lilies. If you want to know if God can take care of you, look at nature. If you want to know if God is concerned about you, look at God's work in nature. You know, as I, as I prepare this message, I reflect on a concept that I, that I go through with my students, that there is, a, there is a philosophy 
there is a theology that dominated the Enlightenment era between 1700s and up to the 1800s. It's called deism. And deism is a type of rationalism where they, they try to look at nature to say you can break it down and you can, you can, it, nature is predictable. They, they claim that nature is so predictable that they can't find any evidence that God is at work in nature. And so they will, they will, they will not deny that God created the world, but they deny his continuous involvement in the world. They feel that everything is predictable and, if, and, and, and it must be able to be explained by science. <laughs> but Jesus, my brother and sisters, is calling us tonight. Jesus is calling us in this passage of scripture to say, look at the birds. Look at the lilies. And when you see the birds and when you see the lilies, I don't want you to see merely uh, um, the, the laws of science. I want you to see God at work. When you look at the birds, when you look at the lilies, I want you to see God at work. And that should help you to know that God will take care of you. So the two, two things, two things that I'll do and then I'll... And I'll, and I'll close. Number one, he said, look at the birds. In verse 26, he says, look at the birds of the air. They neither sow, nor reap, nor gather into barns. And yet, <laughs> and yet, your heavenly father feeds them. If we go by the signs of it, Scientists will tell you that it is natural. It, it, it is based upon nature. But God is saying, look at the birds. The birds don't gather anything into barns. They don't have any barns to stock up things. They don't have any fridge. They don't have any cabinet. But your heavenly father, Jesus is saying, it is your heavenly father who feeds them. And then says, aren't you more valuable than birds? The lesson from the birds is that God will take care of the food. God will feed you. And if you want more evidence of that, I'm going to run through some Bible texts here. In Job 28, verse 39 to 41, the Bible says, Can you hunt the prey for the lion? That's when God was questioning Job. Or satisfy the appetite of the young lions? When they crouch in their dens or lie awake in their thicket, who provides for the raven? Who provides for the raven his prey? When his young ones cry to God for help and wander about for lack of food, Jesus, God is saying, it is he who is the one who feeds the raven. In Psalm 137, verse 9, it says, he gives to the beasts their food. And to the young ravens that cry. And one of my favorite Psalms, Psalm 104, the entire chapter of Psalm 104 reflects upon the providential work of God. It says, These all look to you to give them their food in due season. When you give it to them, they gather it up. When you open their, your hand, they are filled with good things. When you hide your face, they are dismayed. When you take away their breath, they die and return. To their dust. And the final text I'll give you is Matthew 10, verse 29 to 31. Jesus says, Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? And not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. But even the hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore, you are of more value than sparrows. So I want to I want to invite you, my brothers and sisters, to examine your life right now where you are and recognize, just look for today, just, just think about from this morning until now, and I want you to recognize that your life is not an accident. Your life is not an accident. Your life is well cared for by your Heavenly Father. You know, I heard one preacher ask a question, and I, and I thought about it, and I... 
And I get a very, very powerful point from it. He said, listen, the breath in your body is not air. <laughs> because if it was air, then when somebody die, you could blow on them and they come back to life. He said, the breath in your body is a life from God. So the very fact that you're alive, it means that the life of God is inside of you. You are very special. You are very special, and God will take care of you. And that's why the, the Apostle Peter said in 1 Peter 5, verse 7, cast all your cares upon him because he cares for you. When there was drought in the land for three years, God fed Elijah with a raven by a brook. And when the brook dried up, God sent him to a widow who had only a handful of meal remaining and God fed Elijah for those three and a half years. And in, in Deuteronomy chapter 8, Moses reminded Israel that it was God who fed them throughout the wilderness journey. It was God who fed them when they were going through a land of desert. And so he concludes with them, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. So God can feed you. So don't worry. <laughs> don't worry. The second illustration that Jesus gave is found in verse 28 to 29. He says, And why are you anxious about clothing? Why are you anxious about how you look? Look at the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. The grass teaches us how God progressively works to beautify our lives. That's what the lilies teach us. It teaches us that we can trust God to make our lives beautiful in his times. Look at the lilies. The lilies come out of dirt. <laughs> the lilies come out of dirt. It doesn't look promising. But God is able to make it beautiful. Not even Solomon. When God is finished with it, not even Solomon in all his glory is not arrayed like one of these. According to Ellen G. White, in the book, This Half Ages, she says, she says, who would dream of the possibilities of beauty in the rough brown bulb of the lily? But when the life of God hidden therein unfolds at its call in the rain and sunshine, men marvel at the vision of grace and loveliness. Even so will the life of God unfold in every human soul that will yield it itself to the ministry of his grace, which free as the rain and sunshine comes with its benediction, benediction to all. It is the word of God that creates the flowers and the same word will produce in your, your life the graces of the spirit. Let me invite you to do something at this time. I want you to do what Jesus asked us to do. Look at the lilies. And I want to ask you a question about the lily or about any flower, any grass, anything that grows out of the earth. And I want to ask you the question, what is ordinary about a blade of grass? What is ordinary about a plant that grows out of the earth? All right, let me, ask you, let me ask the question a different way. When was the last time you made grass? When, when was the last time you made corn? You might say you, you, you took the grains of the corn and you put it in the earth and you, and, and, and you water it and you say, corn, come up. But did you make it? So what Jesus is asking us to do, brother and sister, is, is that we must look at the grass. Look at it carefully. Because what you're seeing when you look at the grass is a miraculous work and power of God. When you look at the lilies, what you're seeing every day is a mighty work of God, contrary to, to the deists 
contrary to the rationalists who will suggest that these are all natural, the eye of faith must see that it is the power of God who is constantly at work in the things of nature. God did not create the world and leave it up to, to, to just some random um, laws. God is continually at work in every blade of grass. And Jesus says, look at it. It is God at work. And he's saying that the same way God is at work in the grass, he is at work in your life. <laughs> God is constantly at work in your life to make it beautiful. Just as you can see the miraculous work of God in nature, see the miraculous work of God in your life. You know, I remember my days in, at West Indies College when I was in school and, and, and I had to work full time. I had to pay my own school fee. And at the time, I, we were living on our own. Three of us as brothers were living in the same way. We, we had to pay the rent. And I remember one, one evening I went, was going home and I said, to the, I said, Lord, when is this going to end? <laughs> When am I going to have some money? Are gonna, when am I going to stop living like this from, from hand to mouth, from living in uncertainty about the future? And I remember the morning, I was lying on my back on, on the bed, and, and the, the, the sun was just coming up over the horizon. And the Lord, the Spirit of God showed me clearly as that day, I'm telling you. He said, look at the sun. He said, that sun that you see just peeking out over the mountains. He said, if you, if you sit there on that bed and don't move. It, no, before he said that, he said, listen, can you see the sun moving? And I said, no. I said, but if you sit there on that bed until 12 o'clock, that sun is going to be in the sky, the middle of the sky. And if you stay there until 6 o'clock, the sun is going to go over the other horizon. And he said, that is how my work is in your life. My work knows no haste and it knows no delay. You might not be able to see it moving, but I am at work. And I, I got the point. And I said, Lord, forgive me for being anxious. Forgive me for being worried. When I trust my life in your hands, I must be patient enough to watch you work. <laughs> I must be patient enough to watch you move in my life. You must recognize that every part of your life is in the hands of the master artist. <laughs> every part of your life is in the hands of the great and the chief editor. If we were the editors, if we were the editors, we would want to remove some aspect of our lives. Are we together? <laughs> we would want to remove the rust spot. I personally want to remove out of my life the experience of growing up and having little or no money. I, I would want to remove those aspects of my life when I graduated from school and immediately got my first job. I was fired for my job in the first year. I don't want to remove that, those experiences where I grew up in a home, a single parent home with five other siblings and a mother who's living on minimum wage. But in the hands of a master artist, when God is done with your life and people look at your life, they have to be amazed. Not even Solomon in all his glory is not arrayed when God is done with you. God makes all things beautiful in his time. And that's why Moses was able to, in the book of Deuteronomy, get the Israelites to see. <laughs> Read Deuteronomy chapter 8. Moses looked back at the journey and said to them, Listen, when you faced fear, when you faced hunger, when you faced thirst, you thought, you are being punished. You thought you were going through difficulty. But what I want you to know, it was God who allowed you to hunger. 
It was God who allowed you to walk this way because in the end, my brothers and sisters, he's making all things beautiful in his time. When people look at your journey, they must glorify God. Are we together? Just as though when you look at the grass, you glorify God. You see the mighty work of God in your life, you, in, in the grass. The same way when God is finished with your story, people must say, wow, wow. And they give glory to God because he makes all things beautiful in his time. So you can trust him. This is a message that Jesus have. Don't worry. When you commit yourself to him, you can trust your life in his hands. And that's why he said to them in verse 31. So, you know, God, you know, Jesus is a master preacher. Because here's the conclusion. Verse 31. He says, so, in other words, therefore, based, based upon what I said before, therefore, don't worry saying what we shall eat or what we shall drink or what we shall wear for the Gentiles seek after these things. <laughs> but your heavenly father knows that you have need of all these things. I must touch on the Gentile thing just before. I close. You know, one of our, our leaders was talking about um, missionary to the Chinese in Jamaica. And the, the gentleman was mentioning something interesting about the Chinese. He said, he said when you go to, to a Chinese home, one of the first things they will give to you is a cup of hot tea. And the reason they give you that hot tea is so that you won't finish it you will take some time to finish it. It will give enough time for you to have a conversation. And he said that Chinese generally don't have time to talk. They don't have time to have conversation. Why? Because they are busy 24-7 making money. They, they hardly have time to entertain anything else. They are busy making money. And Jesus is saying... That's how the Gentiles live. But people who trust God don't live that way. <laughs> people who trust God are not anxious and worried about money and food and clothes. And that's why he says in, in verse um, 33, But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. Therefore, don't worry about tomorrow. Jesus is saying, my brothers and sisters, if you trust him, if you surrender your life completely to him, he will not only feed you, but he will make your life beautiful in his time. <laughs> you know, before, before I close, I must tell you another story. You know, when I, when I just graduated from school, I, I, I accepted a call to ministry and I spent four years doing my bachelor's in, in religion and theology. And, and when I graduated, I was assigned to, a, to my home district in, in West Jamaica Conference to work as a Bible worker. And I remember one of my friends from high school uh, was passing me on the road. You know, both of us went to the same high school. We graduated from high school and he went on to college and I went on to college. But here's a situation where this gentleman, he, was, he owned his own car. I never owned any. When I went in the car, he had a wife sitting beside him. I, never, I couldn't afford a wife. And he was talking about his house in Coral Gardens. I never even could even think about, matter of fact, I wasn't even paying rent. I was living with my mother. And I, and I started to think about my life. I said, God... Did I make the right choice? <laughs> God, when is this going to move? <laughs> you know, when, is, when is this journey going to get somewhere? And God said, don't worry. Trust me. Be faithful in what I have assigned you to do. And I will make things beautiful in my time. And I can assure you, my brothers and sisters, that indeed, God does make everything beautiful in his time. So don't worry. Don't worry about food. 
Don't worry about how you look. Don't worry about how you look in the eyes of others. Because when God is finished with you, not even Solomon in all his glory will be arrayed as how God makes your life beautiful. May God help us, my brothers and sisters, to trust God, to put him first and trust him wherever we are in our life right now, that indeed, just as how he works to beautify the lily, God is working to beautify your life. God bless you. Amen and amen. Dr. Williams, my Lord. Wow, wow.